Welcome to Live Free. I'm Angela K. Austin. Together, we'll discuss books, we'll explore the world, and we'll do it with some of my closest friends. And hopefully, we'll make new ones along the way. Hey, everybody. I'm Angela K. Austin, and today I'm here with Brian W. Smith. Say hi to everybody, Brian. Hello, everybody. <laughs> All right. All right, guys, so you know that I am one of those authors who's always in book clubs on Facebook, and one of the book clubs that I'm a part of is Chocolate and Wine, which is with my girl, Tasha Parker, and Tasha loves Brian's books, and she has messaged me, she's DM'd me, she's like, Angela, have you talked with Brian W. Smith? These are his books, you need to interview him. And so here we are. I reached out to Brian because Tasha was like, I need to interview this man. So Brian, tell everybody just real quickly before we get deeply into your books, just who you are and what do you write? Why does Tasha love you so much? Tell us who you are. Well, apart from the money that I slipped her so she can say that, uh, I, I am, I am the author of 34 contemporary fiction novels. And I also write a mystery series called The Sleepy Call to Mysteries. When I am not writing for myself, I ghostwrite. Um, I probably average about five novels a year that I ghostwrite for other people. And when I'm not doing that, I own a company called The Script Repository where we adapt novels, authors' novels to screenplays so they can be pitched to Hollywood. And when I'm not doing that, I'm a college professor. I teach creative writing at a couple of colleges here in Dallas. All right, look, okay, a man of many talents. I am not mad at any gotta, of that. You gotta, you gotta have multiple hustles. I, I did, I spent several years, probably hmm, somewhere in the ballpark of 17 years in the corporate world. And I got laid off during the recession in 2009. And I had this big salary and a big office and I just vowed I just vowed I will never put all my eggs in one basket again. I was still an author. I was signed to Simon & Schuster. No, I got signed to Simon & Schuster afterwards. But I was I was an indie publisher. I owned a publishing house back then. So I landed on my feet. But it taught me a valuable lesson. And that is, as long as someone else is signing your checks, you're expendable. I have said that so many times because mm -hmm. I I think like everybody I know who has been in corporate America as long as I have, which is over 20 years, mm -hmm. all of us, everybody has been laid off or, you know, as you said, has been said that they're basically expendable at least once in their career. Yeah. And it's all about like, how do you bounce back from that for so many of us? Because, you know, a lot of people don't have the side hustle that can become the main hustle. Right. So you and I, you know, we have that in common because I teach marketing at a couple of colleges, both online and um, in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and things like that became like the side hustle to my main gig, you know? Yeah, and it was just one of those things. I yeah, never let crazy it go. Because once, once they become um, viable revenue streams and, you know, the my books were already doing well. Like I said, I signed to Simon & Schuster in 2012. But my contract didn't prohibit me from still doing my own thing on the side. So I continued to crank out indie books and I had to, you know, did the Simon Schuster thing and I'm still signed to them. And I became an adjunct professor. Um, and the one thing that came from all of that was a certain level of freedom. I can, I mean, I have a few degrees on the wall. I can always dust them off. But to be honest with you, um, once you stop working for others, it's hard to go back and work for others. So I'm enjoying this space I'm in right now. Yeah, I'm learning that right now. So hard to work for other people when you decide to do your own thing, even, yeah, it is. you know, slightly. You just be like, ooh. <laughs> I, I, I like taking three hour lunch breaks. You oh know? my God, I like starting and not at having two to anyone. You right. know, it's like you can write till three in the morning, go to sleep, wake up at 11 and get, yeah. you know, I, I love it. I love it. I love it. So tell us a little bit, um, I think, about this indie versus traditional. Like, why do you still do indie? We know a little bit because, you know, have that 
your own control. Mm -hmm. But what is the, can you tell us a little bit about the differences between working with the Simon and Schuster and doing your indie books? The, the difference is distribution. You know, when, so when I signed to Simon and Schuster, they bought the rights to a book that I had already published in 2008. And when I published the book in 2008, um, the book was called Nina's Got a Secret. The book made the Dallas Morning News bestseller list and uh, some bestseller lists. And I guess I sold as an indie, I guess I sold probably, I don't know, a little over 3,000 copies. And then I got an agent because the agent read the book and loved it. And she had this idea that this book, public, major publishers usually don't buy pre-published books. They usually try to stay away from those. But her attitude was this book is good enough that it needs to be seen by more people, more than you can as an indie. So she got me a deal, um, Straber and Simon & Schuster, and the book was re-released in 2012. They basically resuscitated a four-year-old book at that point. And the book sold thousands of copies. And the book went on to Black Expression, Amazon, uh, Dallas Morning News again. It made a bunch of best Target bestseller lists. And it was all because of the distribution channels that Simon & Schuster had. They were able to get that book in places that my bank account couldn't. I would get calls, I would get emails from Germany. You know what I'm saying? Jamaica, people who had read the book. Those are places that I couldn't reach as an indie. So that's the biggest thing. The biggest, the biggest difference is distribution. The flip side of that is um, you lose all creative control. You know what I'm saying? They, they, the first thing they did was put a new cover on it. I preferred the original cover. Um, they cut some stuff out that I wanted to keep. And, and I had limited control over anything. Once you cash their check, that advance check, they officially own the rights to it. So, um, and, the, and another thing is, I learned some valuable lessons. And one of the lessons I learned, I tell, I tell independent authors to this day, don't begrudge your, um, your journey. Because one of the things that I learned immediately was that these major publishing houses don't put marketing dollars behind you. So everything you learn as an indie, on how to hustle and sling your book, you're still gonna to have to apply when you get a major book deal. Because if you don't apply those same strategies, they're not giving you the money, but they're still holding you accountable for sales. So your book will not go into a second print run if you don't move enough units. And the only way you're gonna move enough units is if you get out and hustle and sell it because they're not, they're not sending people on book tours anymore, right? So it's a catch-22. On one hand, you're happy to be no longer an indie because you got this major deal and all of the prestige that comes along with it, but you quickly learn that you're still on your own. I've talked with that. I've talked with a lot of indie authors and new, you know, new self-published and indie authors about that because I think so many of us, myself included, you know, we do, we have that dream like, oh, you know, get with that major publisher. Cause you know, when I first started, I submitted to major publishers and agents and stuff. And then it's like you said, I realized that you do get that distribution and you do get those, that readership base who's looking for authors and books that they produce, but you do still have to do the work. You still can't just sit back and yeah. like not do anything. You have to still have a platform and a presence so that they can they know that you're relevant you know yeah, they, they won't read i mean you won't get a second print run you won't get a, you won't get a, another contract for another book yeah so um yeah getting that first deal is only half the battle now you have to move enough units to make them want to resign you. Yeah. yeah yeah so i have a question for you that i thought about because you said contemporary novels ghost writing screenplay professor is one of those your fave What's your, you know, if you could get up and do one of those every day or or are all of them equally as important to you? They are. They are? They are. I, I thought about that. It's a good question. I've actually thought about it myself. And I realized when I try to give one answer, it's not true. 
I, 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 I have adult ADD, I think. I've never been diagnosed, but I think I do. I would be bored out of my mind if I only did one thing. I'm not mad at that. I actually like, I like the chaos. I just do. It just works yeah. for me. Um, I get bored fast. So do I. Having, I. I teach because I enjoy it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I've been I've been an adjunct professor now for nine years. Mm. Five of my students have gone on to get major book deals. That's gratifying. That's nice. When I ghostwrite books for other people, it's gratifying to see people be able to check something off their bucket list. And my, and my it, it's kind of it, it's not kind. It's very it's spiritual for me. I, I look at it. God is God. Those people prayed about getting that accomplished. And the answer to their prayer was to send them to me. So for me, ghostwriting at this point is bigger than me, it's bigger than the person coming to me. I feel like God has saw fit to give me that responsibility. So I, I, I can't say that I like doing one more than the other. I like to do them all because they keep me engaged. Very nice. I like that. I think um, so many of us have gifts. You know, mm-hmm. and I think it's an amazing thing when we realize those gifts and we do use them to help shape, mold, grow others, you know, who are trying to get to where we are or where we have been or whatever. So I think that's pretty amazing. I interviewed some people, um, some friends of mine, probably a few months ago now about ghostwriting. And it's so funny because one of them absolutely hated the experience of ghostwriting but she had so many clients and they all loved her and loved her work, but Mm -hmm. it was just such a tough thing for her that she doesn't do it anymore. So I wondered what you thought about it. So that's- I love it. Look, I get get paid when I I request, Mm -hmm. you know, I get paid my fee and um, there isn't the pressure that I have of my own books. I've I've been blessed now. My books pay for themselves in pre-orders. But I still get out there and I meet the last calendar year, last 12 months, and I know this to be true because I just counted last week. I still, in, in the last, last dating back from April 2020 to April 20, to May 2021, I, um, I met with 50 book clubs via Zoom. 50 book clubs. So I still have to do my thing with my books. When you ghostwrite, you don't have that stress, right? Here's the outline or here's the vision for the book. Here are my fees. Pay my fees. I write your book and I move on to the next project. Um, I don't have to sell the book. <laughs> I don't have to market and promote it. I don't have to do any of that. My work is done and I move on to the next project. Um, yeah, it usually takes me about three to four months to, to, to ghostwrite someone's novel. So I I usually crank out, I mean, a lot of times I'm doing two at the same time. So I, um, yeah, I I usually crank, I'm averaging now about about five to six a year. And that's on top of your own books? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) My my most recent book, Paper Bag, I wrote a book called Paper Bag. Big book has done extremely well. Um, I wrote wrote Paper Bag in in six weeks. It's a 60,000 word novel. Wow. So, but I've been that. doing this, I've been doing this for 17 years. Mm. So as with anything in life, the, the more you do it, the more proficient you become at it. And, and when I'm not writing, I teach creative writing. I teach people how to write novels. So I understand, I understand, I understand different outlining techniques and it just doesn't take me long anymore. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I can, if I sit down, my second, my, my next book comes out on Fourth of July. It's called Animus. I wrote Animus in eight weeks. That's another almost sixty thousand word novel. So it's just gotten to the point now. It's, another thing is that when you are on deadlines, it forces you to be proficient. You know, I, I have to get my book done because I'm still on the hook to go strike someone else's book, multiple people's books. And I still have an agent out in Hollywood asking for the next screenplay. You know what I'm saying? Um, so I, I just, when you have a lot of irons in the fire, when you have a lot of things going on, it has a way of alleviating and diffusing um, procrastination. And a lot of young authors, their biggest hiccup 
is that they spend more time thinking about writing the book than they do writing the book. Because a, a lot of us, you know, when we first started and like you, I haven't been doing it as long as you, but I've been doing this about 14 or 15 years myself. And one of the things is, is like when you have that dream in your head, that, that initial procrastination is that little bit of fear of just finishing it and getting it out there for fear of putting your baby out into the world. That's all procrastination you know. is. Mm -hmm. Procrastination is just fear in disguise. Yep, that's all, that's it, all is. it is. Procrastinate. Whenever you're procrastinating about anything in life, if there is a fear of getting engaging in it, getting it done, whether or not you procrastination is just fear in disguise. That's all it is. And I think the reason why I can write faster is that I no longer have a fear of the process. Mm -hmm. That's fair. I'll give you, and, and when it comes to, I wanted to, because you mentioned screenplay again. So I have a friend, shout out to Lola, Lola Lace. She is um, an author who I think her first love is probably screenplay and, and writing, um, you know, movies or television. So can you tell us, like, have you, how many books have you turned into screenplays? Is there anything that we should keep our eye out for that's you know already- what? God says the same. My Sleepy Carter mystery series is in Hollywood right now, being pitched um, to be a television series. Um, my novel, I wrote, I, wrote, I wrote a novel called Quagmire about five years ago. Um, that is on producer's desk right now. Uh, Paper Bag, the book that I most recently uh, released last year. Screenplay is being wrapped up for that. Um, I have a television series, um, a sitcom that's being, you just, Hollywood moves so slow, right? The only thing we can do is um, write the scripts, get, get the show Bibles ready, the treatments ready to be sent. The manager or agent takes it and they try to work their magic. So, I have a lot of stuff that's out there in Hollywood. It's just about it being um, picked up by the right people. You know, that's one part that I don't worry about anymore because I'm just at a different place spiritually. Um, all I can do is do the work. Everything else will happen in God's time. And that I agree with. Yeah. So now tell me, um, so all of these different books that you just mentioned, Paper paper Bag, I think, is the one that Tasha promotes really heavily right now in her yeah, book club. Yeah. I swear, I think once a week. I'm just, I might be exaggerating a slight bit, but she promotes that book hard. So yeah, yeah. tell us a little bit about these books. And because I've seen that one so much, let's start with that one. But tell us a little bit about the books that you're writing. Well, I, Paper Bag... I write thought-provoking books with a twist, right? That, that, that's my, that's my, um, that's my, my tagline, if you will. So Paper Bag is a book about the brown paper bag test. I was born and raised in New Orleans. I wanted to write a book about colorism, but everyone has a book about colorism. I thought it would be interesting to write a book about the mother of colorism. And the mother of colorism is the brown paper bag test, which can be dated back to the Creole community in New Orleans, the late 1800s, even before the Emancipation uh, Proclamation was signed. So if you go to New Orleans these days, the city is still very segregated. It's still very, um, there are pockets of the city that have what they call now Creole, Black folk, but back in the day they were called Quadroon and all these other names. So the book is about, the book is based on my life. At least the, the, the genesis of the book came from something that I went through in high school where I went to a girl's house and it was after school, we were sitting on the porch and her mother came home and saw me on the porch and told her he has to go home. And I just assumed it was a school day. Maybe she doesn't want her daughter to have company on a school day. So I go home and the next day I try to talk to the girl. She wouldn't talk to me. And when I asked her what was wrong, she said, I can't talk to you anymore. And um, I asked why she said, because you're darker than a brown paper bag. So that was in my teens. 
fast forward, I'm 51 years old now. I wrote paperback at 50. And I guess this story was laying dormant in me. So I wrote a book about a young man who went through the exact same experience I did. 15 years later, he is now a prominent attorney. And he runs into his old high school sweetheart, right? The flame is still there. She's still just as creole looking as ever. But her family hasn't changed and their attitudes about that hasn't changed. They reconnect, go on a date. They decide there's still something here to pursue it. Then her mother finds out that she's reconnected with this guy and she expresses her, dis her discontent. No sooner than she expresses that, this young lady's twin brother gets accused of a murder he didn't commit. And he needs the best attorney money can buy in the city of New Orleans. So now the same mother who didn't want her daughter dating this dark-skinned man has now asked the daughter to ask that dark-skinned man to represent the son. And that's when all hell breaks loose. Because he's going to do it, but he finds out that there is something her family did to his family that is unforgivable. So now he has this moral dilemma, this ethical dilemma. Do I, do I do what I know can be done to get this guy off? Or do I withhold evidence that will all but assure he's going to go to jail and it's my way of getting back at her family? That's paper bag. That is, that is quite a bit of a dilemma. You know, and it's like, and it's because it's, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, was the young man he representing, you know, he's representing part of the, the deed that was done to his family, or is he an innocent, you know? I it's would like, say, but you got to read the book. I know. It's like, come on, Brian. You know, I would say this paper bag is done so well. Paper bag, um, paper bag is. Paperback, I, I checked the other day, Paperback has, I think, about 145 reviews in the seven, eight months since it's been out, and it still has a five-star rating. Very nice. The book has done extremely well, sold thousands of copies. It has been the book of the month by 50 book clubs that I know of in the past eight months, and um, it's done well. Yeah. No complaints. No complaints at all. Yeah, like I say, I know Tasha. She's always and and last but not least, my agent. Like I said, she hit me up and she's like, you know what? Um, start writing a screenplay. So the screenplay has been done and shipped out. Yeah, it sounds like it would do well as a movie, you know, because it's got you know all those kind of like little ethical moral dilemmas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. thought provoking books with a twist. All right. Yeah. And what about that first book that you mentioned, the one that Simon and Schuster picked up and redistributed? Tell us well, a little bit about Nina's that. Nina's got a secret. Nina's got a secret. Nina's got a secret. Kind of speaks to the core of my writing style. Thought-provoking books with a twist. So in Nina's got a secret, this young lady is poor. She's a stripper. Raising her child on her own. And one of the guys who keeps coming to the strip club is a millionaire unattractive millionaire, right? But when you got millions, that makes everybody attractive. He sees her as a potential trophy wife. She sees him as a meal ticket. The catch is, so she marries for money. The catch is, is that she has an eight-year-old daughter and he has an eight-year-old daughter, but his eight-year-old daughter is autistic. So, um, there's a lot of work that goes into raising this child. She doesn't want to be the mother to an autistic child, but he's moved up from New Orleans, the streets of New Orleans, to Monterey, California, the big house on the beach. She loves a new lifestyle. So being a stepmother to this autistic child is just something she has to deal with. She's, when he's not around, she's not nice to this child, right? And he doesn't know it. He's not aware. One day he goes on a business trip. She gets in the car with the kids. She's riding down a wet road. The road is slippery. She slides off the road and goes into a lake. 
Both kids were in the car. Both kids are drowning. Her daughter is thrown from the car and is a few feet away. His autistic child, her stepchild, is within arm's reach. Both kids are screaming for help. She bypasses the autistic child and goes to grab her child. Pulls the child out of the water, car sinks, autistic child drowns. Now she has a secret, Nina's got a secret. And she's gonna take it to a grave, but she has one problem. Someone saw the whole thing. And that's all I'm gonna tell you about the book. So it's Nina's got a secret, and the question is, what will she do to keep it? That's a tough one. Because the moral dilemma is, we all love our kids. Mm -hmm. The moral dilemma is, if you were in the same boat, would your maternal instincts kick in, and would you be inclined to save your own child, even if your stepchild is closer? And see, in my head, I'm like, if her stepchild is closer, why couldn't you just grab her and then... Go to her daughter. Well, the way the book is written is not that easy. I solved the problem. No, it's just like <laughs> Yeah. So yeah. So All right. <laughs> yeah, that's that's that, that's kind of, you know, it's kind of books but, I write. Yeah. But you know, I, and I I, I, really, I, I really do try to write books that make people think. And that does. It really does because and I, I'm trying to think um if Tasha or someone else told me about that one. Um because I remember having a discussion about that choice mm -hmm. of the stepdaughter versus the daughter. So I don't remember who I had a discussion with about that. And it's not just the fact that she's a stepdaughter, she's an autistic child that can't swim. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So who do you save? I mean, the, the reflexive response for most people is, you save the child that's closest to you. Okay, that sounds good. But if you were a single mother struggling with your child, going through the ebbs and flows and ups and downs of life and the two of you were all each other had would you really just blow off reaching going great going grab your own child I, th I think it's easier said than done i can't imagine any parent who would not attempt to help their own child i can't and the way you the know. book is the way the book is written because i know i know how readers are I purposely wrote the book in such a way that she has to make a choice. Okay. So then you play with the reader's own sense of value do do? and morality as well. That's right. So okay. Nina, yeah, Nina's Got a Secret was the book. That, I, you know, I'm one of those people, and I tell, I tell young authors all the time, that if you write a good enough book, and if the major publishing house, although they do try to stay away from books that have already been published, I am living proof that if they feel there is enough meat on the bone still, they'll pick it up. And especially because in the case of someone like yourself, because you have done so much groundwork and you created a platform that sounds very solid and strong, you know. It was, I remember my agent telling me, because, because I was like, I don't know, right? I was, at the time I've written 34 books but remember, this was in 2011 when they first approached me. Um, I ended up signing a deal in 2012. But by that time, Nina's Got a Secret was my eighth novel. And I remember her telling me, you got seven other novels, right? This book is already paid for itself. You've already made money as an indie off this book. It is now four years old. Why do you care? Let them resuscitate it. Take the, take the advance, take the check, keep doing what you're doing. You have seven other books that you can sell. Let them resuscitate this book, give you an advance, collect the royalties, and go on with your career. And I did. It was it was, it was good advice because I, because not only was it I know it was good advice because it's amazing. Um, you make more money um, if you're doing it right as an indie per book sale, you do. Because the royalty, the, the average author, what you might get 7% off every book sold, maybe 10, if you're lucky, if you have a Stephen King type contract, right? So you actually, you make more money per book sale as an indie because there aren't that many middlemen. Um, but 
our, you know, our, our, we, we want to hold on, you know, and you just have to know when to let go. And, and the reason why I know it was a good, a good move for me, because it's amazing what being able, what, what doors are open by being able to, to, to pull up your face on Simon & Schuster's website. I became an adjunct professor in 2012, teacher of creative writing. I know because it's been told to me that one of the first things they did was pull me up on Simon & Schuster. You know, during, 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 the eight, during, the, during the interview process, they were checking my credibility. And I know my, my ugly mug on Simon & Schuster's website helped. So, in the, so at the end of the day, it worked. You know, I have no complaints. No. Sounds like your agent gave you some really sage advice. He did. You know, did. and it's elevated. It was, but basically what she told me was, um, you have to think long range. You have to think long, and, 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 it, and it, it, it still works because a part of my, my, you know, I have, you know, the literary agent, but also in Hollywood, I have a manager that does the pitching of the screenplays. A part of her pitch is the fact that I'm a Simon & Schuster author. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a part of her spiel. So um, it hasn't all been bad. It, it, it has that. You, you have to be able to see the big picture. This, this truly is chess, not checkers. And I will co-sign that 100%. Mm -hmm. All right, so now tell us, um, like what books do you have coming out next? What are you working on? I mean, I know like you have so many things going on, but yeah. like what's happening next? Well, my next novel comes out on July 4th, 4th of July. It's called Animus. And for those who don't know, Animus is, it's a derivative of animosity, right? Animus is uh, extreme dislike right? Form of hate. And um, being from New Orleans, my entire family was affected by Hurricane Katrina. Couple that with the fact that I am a child who grew up in a, an abusive household, physical and verbal abuse. And I had this reoccurring, I have a, I, I, I suffer from PTSD, right? So I have my dad died when I was 18, but I still have nightmares to this day at 51. So I, you know, you can let this stuff eat you up or you can find a way to, to use it, right? So I came up with this idea for a story because I kept asking myself this, this question, what would I do if I could see him today? How would I deal with my dad 33 years later? So I thought that's a, that's a, that's a, there's a book in this. So I came up with this idea to write a book about a man who has animus towards his dad, so much to the point that when he gets married and moved from New Orleans to Dallas, he doesn't, you know, his wife knows, but he doesn't tell his kids that their grandfather is alive. So for 10 years, that, that these kids think that their grandfather died in Vietnam, and he lets them think that. Hurricane Katrina comes, blows through New Orleans, people are evacuating. And the dad who's supposed to be dead shows up at his front door. And now his kids are looking at him like, but you told us he was dead. So not only does he have to explain that, but his wife has never met his dad. She's heard of him, but she's never met his dad. He totally excommunicated his father. So this is her first time meeting her father-in-law. It's the kid's first time meeting their grandfather. And what they're finding is that the man they've met, this 65-year-old, is nothing like the man the dad described. When he is not, when the, when the wife and the kids are nowhere around, the son sees through the act. Not only does the son see through the act, but the dad, with a smirk, winks and says, I ain't changed a bit. But when the kids and the wife come around, he's this decrepit old man. So you got this cat and mouse game going on where the husband is like, he hasn't changed. 
And the wife and the kids are like, dad, stop. So he finally gets frustrated and tells the dad, look, I know you haven't changed. I want you out of my house. You got two weeks to get out of my house or else I'm going to start to inflict the same, the same um, abuse that you put on my mother and me. I'm going to put it on you. And the dad comments because he's still a snake in the grass. He comments with, that's what you think, but I happen to know a thing about you, a thing or two about you that I'm sure you won't want your wife and kids to know. So you're gonna let me back in this family, whether you want to or not. And that's the story. Can't tell you what else happens, but it is a cat and mouse game about a man who um, is trying to convince the world that the father is in fact still the snake in the grass that he knew when he was a child. That's a heck of a story right there. There's a, it reminded me of something that I can't remember. If I, you know, I've read a long time ago, I, but um, that whole cat and mouse of it all, because you're always, you know, you know, you, you, you root for this one person, then the other person knows something. And sometimes it changes your opinion a little bit. Like, wait, is the good guy, bad guy? Sounds yeah. very yeah. intriguing, Brian. I'm very, I like it. Thank and that you. comes out July 4th. 4th of July is called Animus. Okay. And let's All just right. say in line with my um, MO, um, there are a bunch, there's, a, there's a cast of characters that come in and out the story. And I'm just going to say things aren't always what they appear. Very layered story. And um, you'll, I, I, I predict that a lot of readers will be cussing me out by the end of the book. I like it. I like when people curse me out by the end of something. It's like, that tells me that your emotions were all wrapped up. Now, now, now you're in London. Is the reaction the same? No, I just moved to London about eight months ago. So I'm still getting into the London market, but the majority of my readers are still American based. And it's like with my most recent book, the people were, I mean, people were in their feelings. That mean you did your job. That's how I see it. It's like if you were in your feelings when you finished, that means that you were wrapped up. You were connected. I mean, that's right. That's, that's our job. Was, it's what I was trying to do. It's like you don't have to like everybody. You don't have to love everybody. But you were wrapped antagonist, up. In it. The antagonist is not supposed to be like. It's like right? I'm trying to make you rethink certain roles and certain people and in that particular book I wanted people to think about you know what I call bible thumpers my mm -hmm. main character was a mother who was a bible thumper and there is a lot going on in her family and she had um, to come to terms with it and she had to think about the way she'd been raised and the things she'd been taught and what that was doing to her family and to her. And, you know, she had to figure out if she was going to move away from some of those things, reshape some of her thinking or not, you know, right. run the risk of losing everything that she really wanted in her life. And I was challenging people to think about that because we, whether we want to or not, I mean, we all have things that challenge us in our own lives every day, you know, and we can all think that we are really, really good people, that we will make the right decisions if we are faced with something, like you said, with the mother and the autistic stepchild, you know, and her own daughter, you know, what's the moral, what's the moral right <laughs> thing to do? What I try to do with my books is I try to, um, I think a common denominator, a thread in all of my books is that, and I teach this to my students, yes, you have a protagonist, you have an antagonist. But what I try to do is I try to make sure that my antagonist has a cogent argument, has a legitimate beef. You know what I'm saying? And that's what I try to do with Nina's Got a Secret. You may not like this mother, but does that mean that her decision was was as was it really wrong? You know what I'm saying? So I, I try to 
I try to write books where the antagonist has a legitimate argument. You know, I, I one of the things I reference in, 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 in class when I'm teaching is the movie Black Panther. A lot of people like the Killmonger character just as much as they like the Black Panther. And the reason why is because he had a legitimate beef. So I, when I teach writers is that you can have a bad guy and a, and a good guy, a bad woman and a good woman, whoever, you know, however you try to, you choose to do that. But make sure your bad guy has a legitimate beef. That will make your story far more intriguing. Yeah, and I think, you know, and, you know, I don't know how you feel about these, but one of the things that I've actually been enjoying in the recent trends with books and movies and television are the, um, I'm going to call them the, the backstories or the retelling of villains, you know, right. from prominent stories. You know, right. so like if you went to see like Wicked, of course, is one of the ones that really did this, in my opinion, well, but they tell you the story of the Wicked Witch, you know, but in that retelling and that reimagining of her story, she was wrong in so many ways and treated so poorly by everyone around her mm -hmm. that because of that, it shaped her so that by the time we all see her, you know, with Dorothy and Toto, you know, by the time we meet her again, she became the villain that the people made her become. Because when you first meet her, she's protective. She's, you know, um, kind of like this naive, whatever, whatever, you know, she wants to help people and do, you know, help the monkey, save them. She wants to, you know, but then she's beaten down so much that by the time we meet her again, she's like a horrible person, you know? And it's like, it's very interesting when I start seeing all of these things that are doing these reimaginings and retelling. Um, because it's like you just said, it's like, they are giving those back, they're making you rethink those villains. I think that that's one of the, been, I think that's, I think that's part of the secret sauce, if you will, for the, for the book paper bag. Um, because the antagonist in the book, when you read the book, you realize that things were done because of things that were done. The things that she is doing in present time, they have an origin. And when you read the book, as angry as you want to be about the attitudes, you realize where they come from. And it forces you as the reader to pause and read. And, and I, can't, I, I don't try to change people's attitude. It's not my job as a writer. It is my job as a writer to make you think. Now, if you choose to, if you choose to pivot and go in a different direction with your feelings, then that's on you. All I try to do is write books that make you close the book for a second, kind of look up and think about it. Like, well, you know, and if I can do that, mission accomplished. And I have to admit that that's kind of what I like to do. I mean, some books I write because they're just absolutely fun to write. Like I'm always going to write, like, I think a holiday story because I just kind of love very simple, kind, whatever kind of holiday stories. But most of my women's fiction is going to probably twist a woman in knots and it's going to make women who read it. And sometimes it's going to make them very uncomfortable because they're going to wonder, like, why would she say that? Why would she do that? I wouldn't do that. But it's not you, you know. And if you were someone in the case of my last book, Broken Road, who was raised in a very strict kind of upbringing in a very strict church in a very you know in a in a particular type of way if the things that were happening to my character Liz were happening to you you would you know I would like to think that I would react a certain way but right. I don't know you know right. and you don't right. know you know so you have to walk in that person's shoes so you're not going to agree with what they did perhaps but that's the point, you know, right. is to make you think about it. I like it, you know, so I'm all, all about it. You know? Be mad, be angry. Tell me about it. It's all good. It's all we can do. <laughs>
<laughs> All right. So you just told us what's next. How do we keep up with you so that we can be aware of these things when they happen? Well, just go to Facebook and type in Brian W. Smith. I'm out there. Um, I am also on Instagram at author B W Smith. I'm terrible with Instagram and stuff like that. Like I, 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 I need to do better with with everything outside of Facebook. Right? I guess I'm I guess I'm telling my age or whatever. But you know, some of these social media sites require so much upkeep and keep. You know what I'm saying? I look up and I haven't posted anything to Instagram in a month. You know, Twitter is even worse. But if you want to find me a couple of times a week, go to Facebook. I'm out there, Brian W. Smith. My website, if you want to buy autographed copies of my book, is www.authorbrianwsmith.com. If you happen to be an author who is ready to take the next step and get your book turned into a screenplay so it can be pitched to Hollywood, Go to my company, www.script, S-C-R-I-P-T, repository, R-E-P-O-S-I-T-O-R-Y.com, scriptrepository.com. And there's a contact page that will get you through to me. And um, yeah, if you're ready to take your books to the next level and you want to see it on the big screen or the small screen, because we write both screenplays teleplays, uh, right, for television shows, you name it. Stage plays, do a little bit of everything. Uh, go, to that, go to that website and the script repository, scriptrepository.com, and um, that'll get to me as well. All right. I know I'm going to share that with my friend Lola because, you know, that is, I think, her heart's desire. So I'll make sure I send that over to her. All right, my people. Everybody out there in YouTube world and podcast land, I'm Angela K. Austin. This is Brian W. Smith. Thank you so much, Brian, for joining me today. And Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Oh, definitely, definitely. And to all of you guys, if you are watching this on YouTube, make sure that you, I'm going to have everything posted in the description so that you can get to these websites. And if you are listening to this, wherever you get your podcast, it's going to be in the description as well so that you can get to these websites. So no worries. I'll have everything there for you. And to all of you, thank you for joining me. And I hope you guys will all join me again soon. <laughs>